friends. If you got a Bible, I want to invite you to turn in it with me to Joshua chapter 24. We're going to be in just two verses today, Joshua 24 verses 14 and 15. It's a passage that many of us are probably familiar with. Uh, but this passage popped in my head the last couple of weeks, man. I've, I've been thinking lately about how many choices you and I are faced with making every single day. I mean, it's crazy to think about. From the moment we wake up, the moment we go to sleep, how many choices we make. Uh, my wife and I went on vacation last week, and uh, leading up to vacation, we had so many decisions to make, so many choices to make. We had to choose uh, where we wanted to vacation, if we wanted to go to the beach, if we wanted to go to the mountains, if we wanted to go somewhere that was free. And so once we chose the mountains, we had like a plethora of five million cabins to choose from. You know, what kind of cabin did we want to choose? And then once we chose that, what kind of uh, things did we want to do while we were there? Did we want to relax or did we want to uh, go on some fun trips or what did we want to do? And uh, then at the end of vacation, you know, we're, we're, we're left with the choice. Well, do we end our vacation or do we just kind of seize the day, man, and vacation the rest of our life till we're dead. Obviously, we chose to end our vacation and come back home because it's not really fiscally available to us to just vacation the rest of our lives. We have to work and make a living like most of you do. So we chose to come back home. Well, for that week, man, I, I, I was um, out of my workout routine. I was out of my diet, my nutrition plan, all the stuff that I, I do you know, each and every day, day in and day out, and just took a whole week off of it. I came back and I was left with a choice to make. Do I want to do this again? Do I want to pick back up where I left off? And so I chose to get back in the gym. I chose to get back on my diet. And I got to be honest with you, man. Yesterday was leg day. And it was it was like maybe the second worst day of my life. I mean, it was bad. And I woke up this morning and from like the moment I gained consciousness, I am met with this harsh reality and this harsh choice to make. With my legs aching and, and my back hurting, I just turned 30, so I'm like basically ancient now. Um, and, and, and so I'm feeling, man, I'm just hurting, and I had to make this choice this morning when I woke up. Do I want to get out of bed, or do I just want to stay in bed? And obviously I chose to get out of bed and go to work because, again, it is not phys fiscally available or an option to me to just not have a job right now. So I chose to get up. But you and I have so many choices to make each and every day. Some of them are easy. Some of them are tough. Some of them are small little decisions and choices that seem to be insignificant. And some of them are major choices that change the course of our life. But we have choices to make each and every day, every moment. And when you think about it, it can kind of feel exhausting. But in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is at the end of his life. And he has taken the leadership of Israel after Moses died, which, by the way, were huge shoes to fill. And he did a great job, but he led Israel to the Lord. And at the end of his life, he brings Israel to a choice that they needed to make. And so before this passage you're about to read, he's reminding them of all the great things God has done. He's brought them out of Egypt from slavery, and he's brought them into freedom. He's provided for them time in and time out. He's taken care of them. He's done all these things for them. And so he's reminding them of all the things that God has done. In verse 14, he says, Now therefore, so because of all these great things that God has done, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods, lowercase g, that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose, there's that word, choose this day, there's a sense of urgency, whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. And so he leaves them at the end of his life with a choice. Well, you and I, some of the biggest things that we have to choose is we choose what to believe. And we choose who or what to live for, what to serve, who to serve. I want to kind of unpack a couple of those things. So just like the Israelites are left with a choice, you and I have these two huge choices to make. What to believe, who to believe, and what or who to live for or to serve. We could say that either way. I find it so interesting. Um, I've got a number of, of, of atheistic friends, and it's amazing to me how many times I've heard 
somebody say, well, I just can't have that kind of faith. Faith really isn't for me right now. The last couple of weeks, I've had a number of people tell me that at the gym where I work out. Like, well, you know, faith is just not really for me right now. Belief is not really for me right now. And they would, they tell me that they're atheists. But so many people I talk to treat Christians and religious people as the only ones who make a choice to believe in something. So what are the different choices? I mean, if we choose what to believe, and that's so important, what are some of the choices? Well, you can choose to be an atheist, right? You can choose to believe that there is no God. You, you, you can choose to be agnostic and kind of sit on the fence, and maybe there is, maybe there's not, but you still choose to you know, believe or not, and you can choose to believe God, believe that there is a God. Then you get into all other different religions and stuff, which we're not going to get into today, but you have kind of these three major options. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, well the Christians are the only ones, religious people are the only ones who choose what to believe, who choose to have faith. Man, well, one of the things that amazed me, there was a time when I was really struggling in my faith, and so I started thinking about what are the alternatives? Because with every choice, there's an alternative. There's other choices. And every alternative, there's a consequence, right? And so we'll get into that a little later, but I, I, I was so troubled. And, and man, I was like, <laughs> I mean, how do I know that there's a God? How do, I, how do I know? And I started looking into some scientific stuff. And the question that kept bugging me snot out of me as I looked uh, into some of the beliefs of atheists was I kept thinking about how did all this get here? And I would ask the question, well, well, well how how did the universe get here? And, and I would get, you know, met with things like, well, um, it all came from, you know, a participle. Uh, or it came from matter and, and energy. Matter and energy uh, are, are, are the prime reality, the ultimate authority, if you will. It's from whence all things came. And so I'd always had that question, well, when did that get here? As a kid, I used to ask that question about God. Well, how did God get here? You know, I mean, maybe some of you have asked that question. When I was a kid, I mean, that was the big question to me. Well, if everything has a beginning, then... Where's God's beginning? You know, and I couldn't fathom. But the other choice to, to believe that there is no God, you're still met with the same questions. Well, how'd this all get here? Where'd it come from? Where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? And at the end of the day, you get to the, the point where something has always been there. It's eternal. It's always existed. Or at least something exists outside of time, which blows my mind. And maybe it blows yours too. If you think about it, I guarantee you it will. Something started time. You know, something's outside of time. Something had no beginning. It was always here. And so as I got looking into some of the science of this, I realized that atheists choose to believe. If you look at the second law of thermodynamics and the principle of entropy, it shows you that matter and energy can't be what's always been here. It can't be what everything came into existence from. The second law of thermodynamics shows that matter and energy tend toward chaos. You leave a car outside long enough for years and decades, it's going to rust. That's part of that law. And so if matter and energy are eternal, then there would be absolutely no order. Everything would be in chaos today. Everything would be rusty, if you will, unless there's an outside force that acts upon it. Well, scientific law also states that you can't get something out of nothing. So you can't have just had nothing in the beginning. There had to have been something for everything to come from. And if there had to have been something in the beginning, then there's something that transcends time in which all things were created. Christians had the same belief. But we know that it's God. Atheists believe that there was something in the beginning from which all things came. There's a choice to believe it's amazing to me that this stuff is taught, that, that the Big Bang theory is taught. By the way, it's still a theory, that the theory of evolution is taught, macroevolution. Now, microevolution, adaptation, we could get into the differences and all that, but that's not what this message is about. But all these things are still theories. They're theories because they can't be proven by the most basic thing of science, which is the scientific method, which involves recreating, reproducing. And so you can't get scientific law until you can reproduce. None of that stuff is ever possible at being reproduced because first off, nobody was there at the beginning to see it. So nobody really knows. We're just basing off of what we see. But nobody can also recreate it. And so it can never be law. It can never be proven. It's still a theory. But it's taught like it's fact. 
It's amazing what we will believe in our culture when it's backed by smart or important people who say the things that we want to hear. And to say that there's no God, we, we love that because it means there's no consequences. I can live the way I want. But atheists choose to believe. It's not fact. It's not proven. It's still all theory, and it always will be. They choose to believe. Even agnostics I've been harping on atheists for a while. I'm sorry. I just I have so many atheistic friends and my heart burns for them. Even agnostics. These are the ones who say, well, I, I, I just, I don't want to choose what to believe. That's a big decision to make. So I'm just going to choose not to believe. Well, guess what? That's still a choice. You're choosing also to believe that there's no ultimate truth or that there's no way of knowing ultimate truth and that there's no consequence. Agnostics are betting on themselves and believing in themselves. And that's really it. And then you have Christians. You have those of us who choose to believe in God. So we choose what to believe. And we choose who or what to live for. We choose who to serve. In the passage, Joshua shows us there's two options. Basically, he tells the Israelites, you can serve the Lord your God, capital G. You can serve God. Me and my family, we're going to serve him. Because hey, as a reminder, not only is he so real and he's shown us that time and time again, but we believe he's the only God and we know that he's good and he's worth following. and He's been so good to us. We will serve the Lord. We will live for the Lord. And he talks about in verse 14, he says, put away the gods, lowercase g, that your father served back in Egypt. So back in the day before the Lord saved you. They serve these false gods of this foreign land, these powerless gods. And he says, if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, if it's wrong to you, as it is to most of the world today in our culture, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So we can choose to live for God, we can choose to live for false gods or idols, as we see here. And that looks different. That's not just little golden statues, by the way. False gods or idols take many forms today. To kind of go along with that, you and I can, can choose to serve the world and live by the standards that it sets. The standards of morality and the standards of belief. The standards of tolerance, if you will. In which case, they say the things that are right are wrong, and they say the things that are wrong are right. And if you try to identify the distinction between the two, then they call you hateful. But it's loving to show people, listen, man, you're going the wrong way. It leads to a cliff. It's not a one-way road. You can turn around and go the other way. How is that hateful to show people that they're headed to destruction? But that's the way of the world. And you and I can choose to live for God and serve Him, or we can choose to live by the world standards and serve the world. We can serve money. That's another false god. That's another idol. We can always try to get a bigger house, get something bigger, get the next big thing, get, get, you know, make our retirement the best thing. We can choose to serve money. It's an idol. We can choose to serve celebrities, or we ourselves can choose to serve popularity. I think it was really common in high school, some of us remember Man, it was a popularity contest all the time. We wanted to be around people who made us look better. We wanted to be around the desirable people so that people thought better things of us. We wanted to be popular. And it's funny, as we grow older, some of us never really grow out of that. We still want to be seen with certain people. We still want to be seen with a certain status. And so a lot of us buy houses that we can't afford. A lot of us live in areas that we can't afford to live in. A lot of us take jobs that we're not passionate about. We're not called to do because it gives us more money. But that's a false god. That's an idol. American idol. And so often we give so much attention to celebrities and we put them up on a pedestal and we buy their products. We do the things that they're doing. We spend hours watching them on TV and we spend no time with the real celebrity, with the king. We spend no time in his word. Another false god or idol is sometimes people. We can try to live for people's approval. Man, I struggled with this for a long time in my life. I wanted people to approve of me. And so I'll put on this mask, you know? I wasn't sincere in following God. I wasn't sincere in choosing to serve the Lord. 
I wanted to please people. I wanted to get people's approval. And, 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 and when I say that, I want to differentiate. I, I'm not talking about the kind of people serving that Christ calls us to do. I'm not talking about washing people's feet and loving people and meeting their needs. I'm talking about people pleasing. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, Am I a servant of Christ or am I a servant of man? If I'm trying to live to win man's approval, I cannot be a servant of Christ. Because the two collide. You can't serve two masters, especially when they oppose each other. So we choose what to believe. We choose what to live for or who to live for. And we can choose to live for God. We can choose to live for false gods or idols. And the third option, which we don't quite see in the passage, is we can choose to serve and live for ourselves. And that's also a false god. It's right up there with that second choice. We can choose to serve false gods and idols. We can choose to serve ourselves. It's still idolatry. And man, I am convinced it's the most common form of idolatry today. And it's the one that's the most missed. We don't realize that we are the golden bales that we have created and that we are the ones that we're serving. Man, the Israelites, this is amazing to me. After God saves them, Moses goes up on the mountain to talk to God. And God appears to him on this mountain. The people see it and they're afraid. They're terrified. I mean, that's a pretty frightening thing. God just appears in his glory over a mountain and starts hanging out with Moses. I'd be pretty scared too. They start freaking out. And what they do, if you read the passage in Deuteronomy, is they go, hey, what happened to this Moses guy? I mean, did, did this God just kind of, I mean, what, what happened to him? We don't really know this God. I mean, let's go back to worshiping our own gods. And what they do, man, is they take gold and they form an idol. They form a God out of gold. They make a God with their own hands because they can make that God the way they want. And they serve this idol. Well, who are they really serving? They're serving themselves. If they're serving something that they created to look the way they wanted it to look, they're serving their own ideals. You and I struggle with that today, I believe. Especially in the American culture, where the American dream is so popular and common and sought after. It's not about us. So we choose who to live for. We can choose to live for and serve God, idols, or ourselves. I find it interesting talking about choices. And I want to shift the tide here a little bit because you and I choose. The Israelites had a choice to make all throughout scripture. You and I have a choice to make. But you know what's amazing to me is that even God chooses. It, 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 I don't know why it blows my mind so much, but even God chooses. He chose to make creation. There was nothing and it would have been fine. But God was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to choose to make stuff. He chose to make mankind, even though he knew mankind would sin. And, and you know what? I, I sometimes I find it such a funny argument, and I think it's just so often an excuse that we're looking for to not believe in God. Like we said again, so then there's no consequences. I can live however I want. But I find it so interesting how many people get so hung up, and I used to for a while, on, well, if God knew that man would sin, why he make man? Well, aren't, aren't you glad that he did? Because then you and I couldn't even have the debate because we wouldn't even be here because we wouldn't even exist. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm glad he made me, even though he knew I was going to screw up. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't see the problem here. I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, because he's good. He chose to make man, even though he knew we were going to sin. He chose to give us choices. There's power in choice. Why God give man the opportunity to not choose him? There's a great power in choices. He chose to give us choices. And get this, he chose to offer us redemption despite the choices we would make. All from the very beginning. God makes choices, man. All of us make choices. If we were to look at some passages in the word, man, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, if you want to look some of these up, we see that God chose Israel. To be his treasured possession. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 10. I wrote some of these down. We look at this passage and we see that God chose prophets. He chooses some prophets and people to speak for him. 
He chose Isaiah. He chose a number of them throughout the Old Testament. We see in Isaiah 43, 10, he chooses prophets. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9, he chooses us, Christians, believers. He chooses us to be his lights, his witnesses to the world. Man, how amazing. And John 3, 16, man, we, we, we know that one. We could recite it in our sleep probably. And then the word choice isn't in there fully and completely tangibly. We could easily add it in. For God so loved the world, he chose to give his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There's that word believe again. Whosoever chooses to believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I want to camp there for a little bit. See, I mentioned a little while ago, <laughs> every choice has alternatives. If you're taking a multiple choice test, Back in, back in middle school, high school, college, whatever, if you're taking a multiple choice test and there's choice A, B, C, or D, and you choose one, there's three other alternatives. So every choice has alternatives because there's other choices that exist. And every alternative has consequences. So God so loved the world that he chose, we add that word in there, to give his only begotten son, that whoever chooses to believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what happens? What are the alternatives? What are the consequences on those two things that we talked about? We choose what to believe and we choose who to live for. We choose who to serve. What are the alternatives? What are the consequences? This blew my mind, man. When I, when I realized and grasped this stuff, when I was struggling in my faith, when I was struggling with who to devote my life to, me, I wanted to be a rock star, man, or to devote my life to following the Lord. I had this realization, and here's how it is. We have two choices, okay? I know, again, choices. We're talking about choices. If you didn't know, that's what we're talking about. That's what you're watching. So if you're tired of hearing that word, then sorry, you're going to hear some more. I love you, but I'm, I'm sorry. So there's two choices we can make. We can choose to believe in God, and we can choose to serve Him, right? We can choose not to believe in God, to believe that there is no God, and choose to serve anything, anyone else. Choose to serve ourselves, choose to serve idols, choose to serve money, fill in the blank. So what are the consequences of these alternatives? Well, number one, if we choose to serve, if we choose to believe in this great God, and if we choose to live for Him, there's a consequence if we're right. If we're right and we believe in God and we follow him and we live for him, then we spend eternity in paradise with the God who loves us, whose glory is like nothing we've ever experienced. If we choose to believe in God, if we choose to believe in Christ Jesus who paid the penalty for our sins. That's the consequence if we're right. Right? What's the consequence if we're wrong? If we choose to believe in God, if we choose to believe in Jesus, and we choose to devote our life to following Him, that He's not only Savior, but He's also Lord, what's the consequence if we're wrong? We spend our lives loving and serving people and doing our best to make the world a better place. And you know what? When we die, we cease to exist. You know, and, and, and during that time of um, not existing, we're going... Ah, oh, man, I wish I had just spent my life living for me. I regret that. No, that's not what we're doing. You know why? Because we don't exist. We don't have any regrets. We just, we're gone. That's it. End of story. The end. So we just spent our lives loving people, trying to make the world a better place. And then we just cease to exist. That's the consequence if we're wrong. If we believe in God and we serve Him, if we believe in Christ Jesus. So the second choice, we could choose not to believe in this great God, not to believe in the gospel, that Jesus came, that He, uh, that God gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life, and we can choose not to serve Him, not to live for Him. It's a consequence if we're right. We get to live how we want, with no eternal consequence. And when we die, we cease to exist. Again, no regrets, because we just stopped existing. But there's a really big and dire consequence if we're wrong. If we choose to believe that there's no God, there's no Christ Jesus, there's no redemption. I'm free to live however I want to live, so I'm going to live for myself. I'm going to serve myself. If we're wrong, we spend an eternity in separation from God. After we've lived a life in opposition to God, we spend an eternity in separation from this great loving God where our sins cause us 
great misery, and great pain. If you notice, there's only one consequence of all of these four different outcomes that has some pretty terrible consequences. Horrible consequences. Terrifying consequences. The amazing thing to me is God knew the amount of people in this world that were going to choose to not believe, because it's a choice and that we're going to choose to serve themselves. Yet he still offered his blood, offered his life for us. God knew for you and I the amount of times we were going to turn from him, the amount of times we were going to turn our backs on him and, and, and say that we don't believe, or even if we believe that we choose to live for ourselves and we choose sin and we choose wickedness. He knew all that stuff we were going to do. He, he knew the most shameful things that you and I were ever going to do, the things that we are the most embarrassed about, that we never talk about, that we try our best not to think about. He knew those things before we did them. And yet, he chose to give himself for us. He knew that when he chose to come down and walk upon the earth that he created, as a man whom he created, to be put to death, to be spit upon, to be mocked, to be beaten, to be flogged, to be killed by the creation that he made and to be put on a tree that he made, he knew this was going to happen, and he still chose to do it. Joshua's charge in chapter 24, she's telling the Israelites, and he's on his deathbed. There's a sense of urgency, hence the choose this day. He knew he wasn't promised tomorrow. He knew none of them were promised tomorrow, just as you and I are not promised tomorrow. There's an urgency in this choice, and he's on his deathbed at the end of a long life. I don't know if you've ever been near somebody on their deathbed, but the last few things they say are incredibly important. And in his last moments with them, he spends reminding them, remember this great God who loves you, who has saved you, who has brought you out of Egypt and slavery and bondage, and who has brought you into freedom. And even today, the charge is the same, that you and I remember this great God who by the blood of Jesus has brought us out of slavery to sin and bondage and has bought us freedom and grace and forgiveness by the outstretching of his arms upon that cross. So my friend, the charge is the same. Choose this day what you'll believe because there's consequences. There's alternatives. And choose this day who you will live for. My prayer is that before you sleep tonight, that this would be such a heavy burden on your heart, that you would take inventory of your heart and that you would really see, who am I living for? What do I really believe? The book of James shows us in, in chapter two that, that real faith is an active faith. If you really have faith, you're gonna back it up by the way that you believe. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, those who abide in me, who, who, who basically live in me, the vine, will bear fruit. And it's the same thing. If we really believe, there's going to be real action. There's going to be real works. There's going to be real fruit that we produce if we really believe and if we really live for Jesus and if we really abide in him. So my question is, today, tomorrow, the next day, what would you choose to believe? And who will you choose to serve?